Alrighty, so we are going to get started right now. And so pretty much today we are starting the second lesson, even though it is the third lecture. And what we will be talking about is the intertestamental period. Uh, pretty much it's 400 to about 4 BC. And uh, there's a reason why I think it's important to cover this before we actually get into church history. Um, so not to get ahead of myself, I'll just bring that up in the introduction really quickly. You know, before, well, actually, let's pray. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much that we are able to come together and study church history together. And I pray, Lord, that you would help me remember all the stuff that I've learned and that uh, just everything I say will be uh, right and accurate and really just help us understand what you've been doing in your church for the last 2,000 years. Um, so be with us, give us wisdom, have us learn the lessons you would have us learn from this. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So getting back to what I was saying is that um, before we jump into church history, we need to know the prior developments that really created the setting, that really built the world for the church to be born, in a sense. And so let me uh, illustrate it this way. With Think of your own birth, right? Did you just come out of nowhere? Or were there like conditions that made your existence possible? There had to be conditions that made your existence possible. So if I take my parents, well, let me take my existence. I came from my parents, right? Where'd my parents come from? How does a, a Jewish man born in Chicago and raised in Wisconsin meet a French Catholic woman raised in upstate New York and then produce me, <laughs> okay? I mean, pretty much that there has to be a, you know, a story behind that. And the story behind that was my dad was in the Air Force and he ended up being stationed in upstate New York and that's where they met. But why would he be in the Air Force? What's the Air Force? The Air Force didn't even exist before World War II. It came to exist during the Cold War, right? And so he meets my mom smack in the middle of the Cold War, actually as Vietnam was still going on. So of course, military is doing a lot of recruiting, moving their people all over. And those are just some background um, circumstances of how I came into existence. Y'all are gonna have your own version of this, right? And so when we're talking about Jesus, and the church and all that stuff. There's a lot of background stuff that happened that that brought us to the point where uh, the church, as we know, it was gonna it was gonna be possible. It was gonna be born. So the reason why we have to do an intertestamental lecture is because when you finish the Old Testament, you end with Malachi, right? Or if you're reading it in the Jewish order, you end with with Second Chronicles. Either way. When you end with the Old Testament and then you begin with the New Testament in Matthew, there's a lot of things that are just different. You have these things called synagogues. You have rabbis. You have Sadducees and Pharisees. You have this guy named King Herod. You have uh, various cities that you've never heard of like Antioch and Rome and all that kind of stuff. You don't find those in the Old Testament. You have this Roman Empire. You have this group of people called Samaritans. You have the expectation of the Messiah. You have people complaining about taxes. None of that was there in Malachi. None of that was there in Second Chronicles. But you open up Matthew, it's just brought onto the pages like everybody should know what this is all about, right? Like this was normal life for uh, Jews in the first century. And, you know, uh, pretty much what the, what the church um, was going to be born into that environment. So where did these come from? You know, you need to know that because then it makes the New Testament make more sense, okay? So to kind of give you the, the big answer up front, well, not answer, but more or less like a, well, let me just say it. You're going to have a clash, a mix, a marriage in a sense between the Oriental and the Occidental. And those are just fancy scholar words where Oriental means the Middle East, Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, pretty much the ancient Near East. Okay, that was, Those were the ancient Oriental cultures. I know sometimes we think of China, but that's not what the word Oriental originally referred to. Okay, it originally referred to the Middle Eastern cultures. Then you have Occidental, not accidental, but Occidental. Occidental referred to the Western powers like Greece and Rome. Okay, two very different kinds of cultures and peoples and all that, but they're all going to converge. And <laughs> a lot of the converging is going to happen over one spot on the earth. And I'm going to show a little map that should hopefully make sense of that but pretty much you're going to have Abraham the Jews Jesus the apostles they're all oriental they're not occidental and that's important for us to remember because in our culture what are we 
in America. We're more Occidental. Our heritage is from Greece, it's from Rome, it's from Europe. We think like Occidental people think, and it's easy to prove. We normally don't think like Oriental people would think, okay? But the world of the New Testament, especially in Israel, was predominantly Oriental, not Occidental. Now, Paul is the perfect fusion between the two, a man who is thoroughly both, and he shows us that he's both. And so at the end, if we get to the end of this today, it might take me two weeks to get through this, I don't know yet, but I'll, I'll show how Paul's the perfect, I guess you could say, hybrid between these. But why does Occidental and Oriental, why do they end up converging for our understanding of church history? Well, bear with me with this uh, pathetic drawing, but right here you have Israel. <laughs> here you have Africa, here you have the Middle East, and here you have Europe. And all these major superpowers keep converging on the land of Israel throughout history. First, you have the competition between Egypt and let's say Assyria or Babylon. And so for them to get to each other, where are they crossing through? Israel, okay? And then of course, when you have the Persians conquer everything and they come down to Egypt, same thing. They're crossing the same path. And when they're going west to Europe, they cross the same path. And then finally, when Alexander the Great decides he wants to start conquering the Middle East, which direction does he come? Right there and ends up right through Israel. All the major world powers always end up there. And so by the time you get to the Roman Empire, you're going to just have this big melting pot of all these cultures, all this history converging right on this spot. And that is why, you know, to understand the birth of the church, you have to understand both the Oriental and the Occidental. And, you know, hopefully by the end of this lecture, you will. And then next time, or when we get to the next lesson, we could start with Jesus and the church itself. And then context has been set. So if we're going to be talking specifically about um, what happened between the two Testaments, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, first we have to start with the Persian Empire, okay? So if you know your Old Testament, you know Moses led Israel from, to freedom out of Egypt. Well, God threw Moses. They enter the Promised Land, the land of Canaan. They take it over, and it's theirs for a very long time, but they worship other gods. So God spews them out of the land. The Babylonians take them into exile. Um, and then after 70 years, Babylon is defeated and destroyed by the Persians. And the Persians let Israel go back to their land. Okay, And so that's where we're starting right now. Because by the time the Old Testament ends, it's right when the Persians were doing that. Okay, So the Persian Empire rises to power in the mid-6th century B.C., which would be the 500s if you remember, which we talked about last time. And you have this ruler, Cyrus the Great. He's prophesied in Isaiah 44, verse 28. He's prophesied over 100 years before he's even born. Prophesied by name, okay, that he's going to come and he's going to destroy the Babylonians and God will use him to bring Israel back to their land. And that's exactly what happened. Talk about a detailed prophecy. The dude, it wasn't just the empire that was named. It was the ruler by name. And so what you had is you had these two different kingdoms, the Persians and the Medes. They unite, they form an alliance, and together they're able to destroy the Babylonians. They end the Mesopotamian power. Now it's an Iranian power is what we would call it today. And then their successors are going to expand, and eventually the Persian Empire becomes one of the biggest landmass empires in history. They're going to get the Fertile Crescent, which is Israel, all the way down to Egypt. They're going to get Asia Minor, which is Turkey. Uh, they're going to get parts of Greece and even the great flood plains. Um, so some historians say this was the largest land empire until the British in the 1800s. Okay, so if you look at that map at the bottom of the screen, that orange blob is the Persian Empire. And if you know your, your, your Earth map very well, you could tell that stretches from Greece down to Egypt all the way almost to India. I mean, that is a huge, huge empire, okay? So that's why I say right there, it stretched from the Mediterranean Sea to as north as the Caucasus Mountains, which would be North Iran, um, and as far east to the Kush Mountains in India. So a very, very big and successful empire. Now, their influence, how they relate to the story of what happened in between the Old and the New Testament, is the Persians were a very easygoing empire to the people that they ruled. Okay, They allowed the Hebrews to return to their land. They, they offered to provide soldiers to make sure they even safely got there. They permitted the rebuilding of the temple. 
Um, so you think about it, God used Babylon to destroy the temple and to exile the people. God then raised up Persia to bring the people back and to restore the temple. Now, there was a little bit of drama involved in that, a little bit of back and forth. But for the most part, the Persians were helpers. Okay? They were helpers to Israel in this time. Now, the technical name for the Persian period is the um, Achaemenid period, named after the, the ruling dynasty, but we'll just call it the Persian period, so you don't have to learn any new words. Um, but you do see the beginnings of the Persian period in the last Old Testament books, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Okay, So when you're reading those books, understand that this is after the Persians have destroyed the Babylonians, and now this fledgling Israelite community is trying to rebuild after the greatest calamity in their history, which was the exile. Okay? Now, the peace with Persia allows Judaism to develop its theological goals unhindered for almost 300 years. This is important because if they were constantly being harassed by enemies during this time, it'd be kind of hard for them to build their theology. By the time you get to the beginning of the New Testament, there is a very robust, distinct Jewish theology that exists. Now, there's a lot of uh, different denominations, a lot of different parties, but you have a very well-developed theology. Okay, by the time they get exiled to Babylon, they got most of their Old Testament books, but they haven't really had time yet to go through it all and solidify it. Why don't we get into Just, you'll have to walk in a squatting form. You can do it. Um, <laughs> but, but anyhow... Man, I'm waiting to hear the... <laughs> <laughs> but okay you pulled it off all right so um so back back to what i was saying what was i saying uh persia oh yeah 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 so pretty much you you have to have these people able to form schools and just communities where they're going over their theology together really uh crystallizing their doctrine it's easier to do in times of peace and persia the persian period allowed for that okay that way, when we get to the next period, and there's going to be a really big existential threat um, to the Jews themselves, seems like we always have some existential threats, um, they're already going to know like what it means to be a Jew and what it means to, to practice Judaism and why it's worth fighting for, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So during this time, you're going to see the prominence of the law. You can even see that with Ezra, right? Ezra builds this platform, and then he reads the whole law out loud to the whole Israelite community. And then he has uh, other people translate and explain it to them. So you're going to have the prominence of the law, obedience to the law, ritual uh, clean uh, cleanness. And that's why they're not going to allow intermarriage during that time because their neighbors were still pagans, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So during the Persian period, pretty good, pretty chill, pretty laid back for Israel. But all good things come to an end. And so will the Persian Empire. You may have heard of a particular Greek fellow named Alexander the Great. Um, I used to think of him in terms of that old candy, Alexander the Grape, which was a really good, really good form of grape-like lemonhead, but not the same guy. Okay, Alexander the Great was probably one of the most famous conquerors in history. So when you think of Greece way back then, don't think of Greece as a single country. Every city was its own country. They were called city-states. And then eventually you'll get regions. Alexander's father, Philip, decided that, you know what, there's going to be one ruler for all of Greece. There's going to be this unified Greek culture. And then from there, Philip's plan was to then go destroy the Persians, who were the, you know, the king of the hill at that time. Well, Philip gets assassinated. But before he dies, he did unite all of Greece under Macedonia, because it was Philip of Macedonia. So now his 20-year-old son, a guy who was tutored by Aristotle himself, a brilliant tactician, a fierce warrior, um, decides to pick up where his father left off, and yeah, he's going to um, fulfill his father's crusade against Persia. And he defeats the biggest, mightiest empire in history up to that point in just three battles. Now, it could have been two battles, but these were, these were big battles. So the first one was the Battle of the Grandicus River in Upper Turkey, and the Greeks defeated the Persian army. Now, I'm not going to bog you down with uh, war details, but th the Greeks had a smaller force. The Persians had a bigger force, but Greek strategy was better. They had a form of fighting called the phalanx. And if you've ever seen 300, hopefully you edited out the bad parts, but that shows you the phalanx, where instead of like dudes fighting in onesies and twosies, charging people with their swords, you have them form a human tank with their shield, their spears. And so like a small force could defeat a much bigger force. 
because of that, that strategy of the phalanx. And so Alexander, with that tactic, was able to win, but it was close. It was very close, right? And so when the Persians got beat, and obviously they weren't expecting to get beat, they're thinking that, all right, we got to stop this guy. So Alexander pushes further east, and they're going to have, uh, well, south and east, and they're going to have this big battle called the Battle of Isis in 333 B.C. And, uh, man, this one, this is where he fights the main Persian professional army. These were the best that the Persians had to offer. It was a very, very close battle. And the only reason Alexander won is because the Persian ruler, Darius, who was there, got scared in the middle of the battle and fled. And when your king runs, you start to lose confidence. And so then pretty much uh, his soldiers started to break ranks, and that gave Alexander just what he needed. Now, this should have ended the war. He destroyed the Persian army. But what baffles historians is Alexander, instead of going east and finishing off the Persians, he decides to go south and conquer Egypt um, and to take over Israel and Syria, you know, and, and all that stuff. Why? That's one of history's great questions. But what I can tell you is it fulfilled Ezekiel 26, because in Ezekiel 26, the unconquerable city of Tyre was said that it was going to be destroyed and thrown into the sea and its ruins would be used to set up fishing nets to catch fish. And Alexander is the one who destroyed Tyre. And to this day, its ancient pillars under the water have nets on them and are used to catch fish. So I think God knows the future because he's God. But anyhow, because Alexander decided to move southward and to conquer Tyre and do all that stuff, this allowed Darius in the east to build another big army. So the Persians have one more chance. And so the third big battle was Gagamela in 331. And it was also very close, and they lost for the same reason. Again, Darius panicked, he fled, his soldiers then lost heart, if you will. And so that army was defeated, and then Darius tries to run home, and one of his own guys kills him. You know, I don't know if it's like, all right, you ran too many times. You know, whatever, he gets killed. The Persian Empire is finished. Alexander shows up and uh, pretty much takes over the palace, the capital, um, and all that stuff. So now he has taken out in three battles the biggest empire in the world. And Alexander, I guess you could say he was kind of greedy because this wasn't good enough for him. He's like, you know what? I'm not going to just keep the Persian Empire. I'm going to go all the way to the edge of the earth. So he goes all the way to India, all the way to the Indus River, and actually defeats some of the major Indian kingdoms as well, although they put up one heck of a fight for him. He, after he won those battles, he would have kept going, but his soldiers finally mutinied. They're like, dude, we've been fighting too long okay we're, we want to go back and see our families and so if your soldiers won't follow you even if you're alexander the great you got to stop okay so alexander the great's like fine let's go back to mesopotamia which would be modern day iraq um, and then he goes back and in babylon he dies mysteriously as a i think a 32 year old maybe 33 um, and there's again nobody knows why he died um, some people think he uh, was poisoned or assassinated some people think it was just there was lead in Babylon at that time, and so he unwittingly ate something that killed him. Who knows? Who knows? But point is, young Alexander's career gets cut short. Now, just to show you a picture of the extent of his empire, it's pretty much almost as big as, in, as, as the, the Persian one. Um, so it's just very, very interesting. Um, but he died. So what do you think happens when a guy like Alexander dies? Do you think that his empire is going to stay intact? I mean, if history is any guide, it never works that way. Um, but I'll get to that. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So let me talk about his achievements first. In his short life, what did he achieve with these conquests? <clears throat> and then we'll get to this empire or what happens to his empire after he dies. You know how the Persians kind of let you do your own thing? So when they took over Israel, the Persians were like, hey, build your temple, worship your God. The, the Persian mentality was, hey, we believe in our gods, but we don't not believe in your gods. And so if all these peoples we conquer are praying to their own gods on our behalf, that's only better for us. Okay, That's how the Persians thought. The Greeks were the exact opposite. They're like, all your gods are weak. They're probably not even real. And if they are, well, they lost our gods anyway. So why are you still worshiping them? So the Greeks wanted to force people to be just like them. And so that's why historians will say that Alexander's an apostle, a messenger, a spreader of Hellenism. Now, what is Hellenism? You know, it comes from the ancient word hellas, which is the ancient Greek word for Greek. Okay, so it has nothing to do with hell. 
It has to do with Greek culture. So what he was trying to do is make the whole world Greek, speak Greek, Greek religion, Greek philosophy, all this stuff. And so what he's going to do, even in his short time, I mean, he only uh, was king for, what, 12 years before he died? In that time, not only does he conquer so much of the world, but he establishes hundreds of colonies everywhere, okay? Greek colonies and all these, uh, these lands he's conquered. And then he has his troops marry the local women. Now, why would he do that? So that his troops could then pass on Greek culture, religion, and all that to these women. And then they start making babies. And you know how it works. Over a generation or two, what was a Persian or a Babylonian or even a, a Jewish um, area over the course of time will become a Greek area and the original form gets forgotten. That was the plan, okay? And he would even build cities. Like if there's a lot of Antiochs back then, they were built by him as operational bases to spread Hellenism. So what they say is that Alexander had what you call an ecumenical concept. He was one of the first to say there needs to be a one world government, one religion, one language, one king. Kind of sounds like the Antichrist, but that's what Alexander um, was going for. He wanted to make Greek replace Aramaic as the lingua franca, the language that everybody spoke. Um, and yeah, this was, he was dead set on doing this. There was nothing that was going to get him to stop this plan. Now, what do you think happens, though? Remember what I called the Greeks. They were Occidental, their culture, and they're invading the Oriental world. Now, if they were like the Persians and said, hey, you do you, there would have been no problem. But these guys take over that same amount of land, right? Going back to that same amount of land as the Persians, okay? But they want everybody in that land to be Greek. So now you're going to have this clash of Occidental with Oriental, and it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while as these worldviews are clashing. Now, Alexander dies in 323. He never consolidates his empire, and he failed to achieve his ecumenical goals. There will not be one world government. There will not be one king. It's going to splinter. It's going to break up. But what I will say is his goal of spreading Greek culture all over the world succeeded. Um, I mean, ask yourself, what's the New Testament written in? Anybody know? Greek. How'd that happen? Alexander the Great. Now, the empire, okay, after his death, there's going to be internal fighting for 20 years, really between three of his generals and then a fourth guy that worked for one of those generals. And so eventually the empire splits four ways between these four generals. These are called the wars of the Di, uh, Didakoi, uh, the Didakoi, you know, the, his, the war of his subordinate generals or kings, okay? And so pretty much I'm not going to go into the detail about all four. There's only two of them that are important for what we're talking about. Okay, two of those. I, so picture his big empire gets split four ways, as this picture shows at the bottom. The different colors show you the four ways of being split. All that matters to us is the orange and the purple. Okay, the orange and the purple. The green and the yellow, you don't need to worry about. Okay, it's the orange and the purple. So you have the, the purple is the Ptolemies of Egypt. So one of his generals, General Ptolemy, took over Egypt and henceforth becomes the Egyptian king. They're called the Ptolemies. So how many of you have heard of Cleopatra? You know, we've all heard of the Cleopatra. There was actually a lot of Cleopatras. But here's what I want you to understand. She was Greek. Was she the ruler of Egypt? Yes. Was she Egyptian? No, she was Greek. The Egyptians were ruled by Greece for a long time, and their rulers were called the Ptolemies. Now, that orange blob there were called the Seleucids because that general's name was Seleucus. So he takes over uh, Syria, uh, Iraq, or Mesopotamia, and part of Iran. So he gets that section. Now, the reason why this is important for what we're talking about is between Egypt and the Seleucids, they're constantly going to be fighting each other. And remember that first map I showed you? If these, are, if these guys are going to do battle, what land do they have to walk through to get to each other? Israel. They're always going to be going through Israel. And so at first, if you look at that map, Israel is purple. It belongs to the Egyptians at this point, to the Ptolemies. It's not always going to stay there. Okay. And so that's what I, I want you to understand. Now, the Ptolemies rule Palestine from 300 to 200 BC, and they, like the Persians, had a hands-off policy. Ptolemy was smart. He was not like Alexander. He realized it'd be way too hard to force these people to be Greek. So his whole thing is pay your taxes, accept that we're the overlords and we're fine. You don't have to learn Greek. You don't have to do all that stuff. Okay. So they left the Jews alone for a hundred years. 
And this is going to allow the later Old Testament Judaism to grow through its childhood stages, which then leads to the beginning of early Judaism. And by the way, from a technical standpoint, the phrase early Judaism refers to the second temple Judaism. Okay, like this is what the Jews started believing around this time. As I said, how they like solidified um, their theology during this time. It's called early Judaism. So this allowed that to develop. How many of you have heard of the Septuagint? Okay, the Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. It was made in Alexandria, Egypt, because a lot of Jews moved to Egypt during this time because the Ptolemies were so nice. And so they set up a really big uh, Jewish community in, in Alexandria. And then uh, one of the Ptolemy rulers was creating the world's biggest library of the time. And he didn't mind having an Old Testament. And so because of that, there's this legend that 70 scholars um, made the translation. That's propaganda. It emerged over time. But the point is you end up with a Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is very important for the spread of Christianity at first. But I'll save that for a, a later time. Um, the point is Old Testament Judaism grows. It matures. But then what's going to happen is those other folks, the orange blob on that map, the Seleucids, they were like Alexander. Everybody under them is going to be Greek. They're going to worship the Greek gods. They're going to follow the Greek philosophy, all that kind of stuff. They're going to speak Greek. They're going to have Greek gymnasiums, which, I mean, they wrestled naked. I mean, come on. They performed their sports naked. The Oriental cultures aren't going to like that. Don't know what's wrong with the Occidental ones to where they ever thought that was cool, especially grappling. But anyhow, you know, the point is, the Seleucids, they're the ideological heirs of Alexander. They wanted to spread Hellenism, and they are going to conquer Israel around 200 B.C. They're going to snatch it from the hands of the Ptolemies under a ruler named Antiochus III. Okay? Now, at first, the Jews in Israel thought Antiochus was a friend, so they actually helped him defeat uh, the Ptolemies. Boy, would they come to regret that, because Alex or Antiochus III's son is going to try to destroy the Jews. You're going to have like a, a Holocaust type um, moment. And so he is called Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He called himself Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, Epiphanes means God in the flesh or God manifest. So this guy was declaring himself to be Zeus in the flesh. Now the Jews called him Antiochus Epiphanes, which means the madman. So they were able to come up with their own little rap that rhymed with it and made fun of him. But the point is, this guy, he made a very violent and aggressive push to destroy the Jewish religion. Um, so long story short, he conquers Jerusalem. He turns it into a pagan city, builds a gymnasium so that they could all wrestle in the nude. Um, you know, goes into the temple of Jerusalem, erects a statue of Zeus in the Holy of Holies and sacrifices a pig to it. And then... He goes on, on, pretty much gives the order that all Torah scrolls, meaning the first five books of the Bible and all the prophets, it has to be burned, destroyed. Okay, go through the whole land. If anybody's found with any part of the Old Testament, they're to be killed. And if a mother circumcises her baby, both the baby and the mother are supposed to be killed on the spot. Okay, so what do you think happened in this time? Well, what normally happens is a lot of these people sold out to save their lives. They sold out God. And so... So they stopped circumcising their kids. Some of them made sacrifices to Zeus, all that kind of stuff, right? But you have those who are, who are pure. They hold out. They're like, we are not going to do this. They had to flee the cities and start living in caves for about three years. Life got really bad. Well, that wasn't good enough for Antiochus. So he sent a, a, a servant going from village to village and cave to cave with a statue of Zeus and some pigs. And anybody who would not sacrifice the pig to Zeus would be killed. And so they're, they're looking for these people who are hiding. They come to this old man from the priestly class named Matthias. And when the, the aid of Antiochus comes to, uh, to Matthias and says, you need to sacrifice this pig, Matthias kills that man and all the soldiers that are with him. And then when people hear about this, they rally behind Matthias. Um, and, and this happened at Modin, okay? They rally behind him. He only is going to live a couple more years because he was old. But his son, Judas, who's going to be called the Maccabeus. Anybody know what the Maccabee means? The hammer. That was their nickname. That wasn't their last name. Okay, but this guy, the crazy thing is Judas Maccabeus was able to defeat the Greek army with a ragtag band outnumbered again and again using like tactics that make no sense. And they're able to beat phalanxes. 
It was nothing less than miraculous. And he would go into battle and he would rally his troops. He'd be like, listen, let's read the Old Testament. How many times did we, the Israelites, defeat bigger, stronger enemies just because we obeyed God? It happened again and again and again. They could outnumber us. They could have better weapons. Just charge with believing that God's with us and we will win every time. And they won most of the time. There were some battles that they did lose. Eventually, uh, Judas did go into a battle where he was hopelessly outnumbered and he did get killed. And so then the mantle passed to his brothers. And then he had another good brother. And and this is epic. I mean, this straight up Lord of the Rings stuff that um, the Seleucids decided to charge the Israelites um, with uh, their commander on top of this really big elephant. They never fought elephants before. This dude ran right under that elephant and gutted it and killed it, but then the elephant fell on him and killed him. So it was a tie. But, but once, he, once he died under that elephant and the, the, the commander, the general, fell off that elephant, he got killed as well. And so then again, they rally. Now, after him, it still went to the brothers because, you know, uh, Matthias had multiple sons. The brothers were not as holy as Judas was, okay? They were much more corrupt, but enough victories had happened to where they were able to drive the Seleucids really out of Israel. Now, at first, they wouldn't fight on the Sabbath. Wherever they, uh, they liberated, they would enforce the law of Moses. And if anybody did sell out and sacrifice to Zeus, you know what they would do to them. You know, you guys are traitors to Israel. Um, so it was just, it was very interesting. And, and they liberated the temple. They freed Jerusalem. They got rid of that, uh, that statue of Zeus in the temple. They rededicated it. I don't know if you know this, but this is where the the holiday of Hanukkah comes from. Um, It comes from this. And some people are like, well, it's not mentioned in the Bible. Actually, it is. It's mentioned in John chapter 10, verse 22. Jesus goes to Jerusalem and he celebrates Hanukkah. It's called the Feast of Lights or the Feast of Dedication. So Jesus thought it was worthy enough to leave Galilee and walk 70 miles down to Jerusalem to celebrate Hanukkah. So yes, it is a biblical holiday. And the circumstances that led to it being created are all prophesied in Daniel chapter 8. Um, hundreds of years in advance. But anyhow, the the whole story with that is, one, it commemorates um, the victory over the Seleucids, but number two, when they um, redeemed the temple, they only had enough oil for one day, as the legend goes, you know. And But the thing is, they needed the oil to burn for eight days. Um, so, or, or no, no, what it was is it would take seven or eight more days for them to make a new batch of oil, but they wanted to rededicate it So they used the one day of oil they had, and it miraculously burned eight days. And that's why Hanukkah is an eight-day celebration. Now, the whole present giving, that was just our way of uh, competing with Christmas. You know, that way little Jewish kids weren't feeling left out when their Christian neighbors get all these presents. Um, But I still say Christmas is better. And in my household, we do both. But we're cheap, so they don't get great gifts. But they get some (laughs) stuff. But anyhow, so, so the thing is, Uh, As I mentioned, it passes to the brothers. The brothers are corrupt. They're ungodly. And so what do they do? Even though they're from the priestly line, they set themselves up as kings. And they're called the uh, the Hasmonean, I can never say it right, the Hasmonean dynasty. And it only lasts a short while, about 100 years. But uh, Israel's independent. They're calling their own shots. But it's a corrupt family that knows the sons of David are supposed to be kings. But these guys are making themselves king, right? And, and sometimes they will hire mercenaries to kill their own people who revolt against them. So the Hasmoneans were not good. Yeah, Judas was great, but man, after him, it was all downhill. A hundred years later, the Romans come into the scenario. That's how we get Romans ruling over Israel. And when the Romans showed up, they were first seen as liberators. We would rather these foreigners from Europe rule us than our own people who are ruling us with the heavy hand. Until Pompey, the guy who defeats them, General Pompey of Rome, right when he defeats them, the first thing he does is he walks into the temple and defiles it. And so again, they're like, ah, here we go again. You know, um, just not easy being an Israelite, right? The, the whole history has been difficult, okay? But, you know, just a little picture here. That's a, a coin of Antiochus IV. And then, of course, there's the menorah commemorating the victory. Um, so, all that, though, with, with the Seleucids being defeated by the Hasmoneans and then the Hasmoneans being defeated by the Romans, um, that brings us to the Roman Empire. Now, when you open up the New Testament, these are the guys in charge. These are the guys in power. It, it's their time. It's their hegemony. Okay? So we're getting closer, at least, to the politics of what you find in the New Testament. right? So we're closing that gap. 
We end with Malachi and it's Persians. We open with Matthew and it's Romans. So now we're at the Romans, okay? And the interesting thing about the Romans is this is the first time in history that a Mediterranean power became the central power of the world. Most powers of the world were either North African, meaning Egypt, um, or Carthage, um, and then Middle Eastern. You got Babylon, you got um, Persia. Those were the powerhouses of the world for most of history. But now you got a Mediterranean power being the, the center power of the world. And, you know, there's a lot of explanations for how Rome pulled it off. Um, Italy sustained a large population. Uh, they were, it was a very fertile land, so when there's a lot of food, there's a lot of people. Uh, and at first, and I, I took, when I was an undergrad in college, I took a class just on Roman history, and I loved it. And the one thing that stood out is when Rome started expanding, they're not the Romans you picture. They, they were, they just, they didn't know what they were doing. They were like the Russians in the sense that they win wars with numbers. You know, not strategy, not tactics, not better technology. They're just like, flood the field. We got plenty of people who could die and be spared. Eventually, we're going to win just because of how many people we have. And that's how they won their wars for like the first couple hundreds of years. But here's where the Romans were smart. Whenever they defeated a people, they took the best of what those people had to offer. So they'd be like, well, wait a minute. The Carthaginians, they're a good naval power. And their armies arranged very well. And then when they, they start conquering the Greeks, they take the phalanx concept and they perfect it. Okay, so if you've ever seen the movie Gladiator and you watch that opening scene where they just crush those Germans, you know, it's because they perfected uh, that Greek form of fighting. So they take the best naval, best land technology. They take the best technology and science, period, of their conquered enemies. They make it their own. And by the time you get to the first century B.C., they could sustain warfare on a level that the world had never seen. So even if you beat somebody, it doesn't mean you're better than them. And the Romans realized that. They're like, we won just because we got more people. But now let's take what made these people so great and make it our own and then combine that with our numbers and our wealth. And that's why the Romans probably are going to have, in my opinion, the most successful empire in history. It lasts over a thousand years when you think about it, at least in part. It's insane what they were able to do. And Rome, the city in the first century, had better technology and better hygiene than Paris in the 1800s, the beginning of the 1800s, 1700s, 1800s. You go back to Rome in the first century, and it was more advanced than Paris, Peru, in the 1700s. That tells you something. That tells you just how, uh, how legit the Roman Empire was. Now, they finished off the remains of Alexander's empire by conquering those four divisions. Although the Seleucids, they conquered part of it, but then you had a resurgent Persian empire called the Parthians, and they're going to pretty much take over the Seleucid part and push the Romans back into Israel. So the, the extent of Rome will be Israel, but then they're going to have everything all the way to Spain and all of North Africa, so they're still going to be um, huge, absolutely huge. Now, a little bit about the Roman rule um, to understand a little bit about these guys. The Romans at first were like the Persians, and actually for a lot of their history, they were like the Persians. They're not in the business of trying to make you Roman, not at first, okay? The idea was they're like, it would be a lot cheaper for us if we let the kings of the people we conquer still rule them, as long as they're in line and pay their taxes and know who's in command. Now, if they cross us, we will kill that king, and we will then put our own guys in power. Okay, and we'll make examples out of people's kind of how the Romans would 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 do it. And so for the most part, kings or governors, um, you know, would be what they would use. If the people aren't going to fight back, they get to keep their king. If they do fight back, then it's a Roman governor. Now, that should sound familiar to you, because who ultimately allows Jesus to be crucified on a human standpoint? It was a governor, Pontius Pilate. You don't find that in the Old Testament, but you do find it in the New Testament. Right. And so, again, it all is because of what we know about the, the Romans, okay? Um, now, when it came to Israel, they used a client king. Uh, Caesar Augustus, who's going to be the first Roman emperor, is going to make Herod the Great the king of the Jews. And the irony is he wasn't a Jew. He was half Edomite, Edomite or Idumean, um, is what they were called in that time, and he was half Arabic. Um, and so he, he wasn't a Jew, but he was made king of the Jews. And the Jews hated him. Um, not so much because he wasn't Jewish, but because uh, that was part of it. But there was also flagrant corruption, and they were Hellenists. They sucked up to the Romans, and they were doing anything and everything that was going to, um, you know, promote uh, the the Occidental way of life. And so you can't see the bottom bullet on that border, but I just put the word debauchery. 
These were very immoral people, the Herods. Um, and so, yeah, the, the typical Israelite is not going to be a fan for them. Now, when we read the New Testament, do you get the impression in the Gospels that the Jewish people, by and large, are fans of the Roman Empire, or are they critics of the Roman Empire? Anybody want to throw it out there? Are they fans or are they haters? They're haters. Yeah. And so you might be thinking, like, well, why? Why would they be... Uh, why would they hate the Roman Empire? And so we'll get to that, you know, because there's a couple things about the Roman Empire that were really good and it would make you wonder, like, why would the Jews hate them? And so, you know, just, just get into it, like, well, let me explain what's good, right? The Romans did not force their Roman Greco worldview on their subjects, okay? That's why they would use local kings when they could. So if they're going to let you keep your own culture, why would the Jews hate them? Primarily economic. You guys have all heard about taxes, right? Especially when you read the Gospels, tax collectors come up again and again. By the New Testament time, the Roman Empire it aged, and all of its operations to maintain that empire cost a lot more money. And where do you think they got the money? They shook the conquered people down, and they shook them down a lot. Taxes increased so heavily in Egypt, smaller villages disappeared. The people actually just fled and went down into the middle of Africa and blended in with different people groups. They're like, we can't afford to even live in our village with, uh, with Roman taxes. And of course, you have the famous story of the, uh, one of the most famous rabbis of the time, Hillel. Um, he actually hollowed out his staff so he could fill it with grain and hide it and not pay his taxes. Okay? And, and so you might say, how bad were the taxes? 30 to 40% of your income. So imagine if you barely make enough to feed your family and pay your bills, but then the government comes in and takes 40% of what you make. You don't really have enough left over, okay? And so that's one reason they're going to hate the Romans so much, okay? And the reason they're going to hate Jewish tax collectors is because they're traitors. And I've mentioned this before in some of my sermons. So here's the way the Roman taxation system worked, okay? Let's say this particular region, let's say Galilee, or, or maybe not Galilee, let's just say Capernaum, you know, or the cities around the Sea of Galilee, okay? Let's call that a region. The Roman government determines that region owes this much in taxes. So you'd have a rich person called a publican saying, Roman government, I will pay you what that region owes you as long as you give me the right to collect it from them back and as long as I have the right to collect more than what I'm paying you. And the Romans would be like, hey, we don't care. As long as we get what's owed to us, collect as much as you want. And so then the publicans would do that. They would collect a lot more than what the Roman government actually required. And then to help them with it, the publican would hire Jewish tax collectors to be the ones who go door to door and shake the people down. Now, those Jewish tax collectors are able to collect more than the publican wants. You see what's happening here? Let's say the Romans only require 25 percent. The publican now requires 35 percent. And then those Jewish tax collectors, they want their cut. And so then it becomes 40 percent. So they're bleeding their own people dry. And the Old Testament forbids this. It forbids, um, the Old Testament forbids um, Jewish people um, charging interest and all that kind of stuff and, and doing these kind of practices to, uh, to their brothers. Yet they did it anyway, these tax collectors, because they wanted to be rich. And so you could understand why there's such a hatred for tax collectors in the New Testament. You know, so if you're using this, those texts, to justify hating the IRS, I'm telling you it's not the same. <laughs> It is not the same. It's not even close to the same. Pay your taxes if you like your roads and if you like your sewers and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, yeah, I'm sure there's corruption with the IRS as well. But anyhow, um, so, yeah, you, you got that going on. And then um, and if you want a really good gospel depiction of what I just said about tax collecting, all you got to do is read Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, which is the story of Zacchaeus. If all you remember about it is he was a little short guy that climbed a tree, you missed the point. He was a tax collector that everybody hated. And then Jesus calls him by name and goes and eats with him. And then people are like, how are you eating with them? And then Jesus is like, he's a son of Abraham too. And salvation's come to his house. And Zacchaeus says, not only will I pay back everybody that I've ripped off, I'll give them four times as much. Think about that. So he's admitting as a tax collector, yeah, I've collected more than I'm supposed to. Not only am I repenting by giving that back, I'm going to give so much more back. That shows a heart of repentance. Okay, And so that story does not make sense if you don't know the historical background of Roman taxation. And that is why everybody thinks it's about a tree and a little guy. It's not. 
It's about so much more, okay? Um, and then, of course, you know, it wasn't just the economic reasons. The Jews disliked the Rome for political reasons as well, for empowering the Herods. Now, here's the problem. After Herod the Great dies and his son Archelaus takes over, Archelaus is just as brutal as Herod is. And so around 6 AD, um, or AD 6, uh, the Jews are going to revolt. There's going to be a guy named Judas the Galilean who's going to revolt, and it's such a big revolt, such a successful revolt, that um, the, the Herod family, Archelaus, has to call in Rome to bail them out. And when they come in, they're going to depose Archelaus, and that's when they first put governors in charge of Judea. They're like, all right, you Herods obviously can't control Jerusalem in this part, so now we're going to put governors in charge. Um, they killed Judas the Galilean. Um, and when Judas the Galilean got killed, he became a martyr, and that's what led to the Zealot faction. And so for those of you watching The Chosen, if you like Simon Z, the Zealot, he comes out of that. And I'll talk a little bit about them, um, you know, a, a little later. But, but the bottom line that I'm, that I'm trying to get across with this is that after that revolt and after the suppression of that revolt and after the Roman governors were put in charge, they started ruling Israel with a much harsher hand and had no problem crucifying people, just to make an example. One time, I believe it was over 2,000 people publicly crucified, just left on the crosses for three days for all other Jews to see. At that point, the zealots only grow in number. People start to hate Rome. And this is when they start truly longing for the Messiah because their thought was the Messiah will overthrow the Romans and get them out of here, and we won't have to worry about this stuff anymore. And so um, it was because the, the Roman hand became very heavy. They started, you know, you might hear things like, well, the Jews considered the Gentiles dogs. They did, but the Gentiles considered them dogs. And it was very common for the Romans to say, you know, you, know, you better not look at me, dog, or I'm going to kill you. And it wasn't like, you know, gangsters today, like, what up, dog? Not that. It was more like they were calling them, you're a dog. Dude, and you're not worthy of life. And so they killed them for really, really just dumb things. And so there's a reason why things are going to just boil and boil and boil until you get to the Jewish revolt that started in 66. But that's something to mention in a different lesson. So with all that, right, I've kind of taken us through the history, getting us from the Persian Empire to the Greek Empire uh, to the Roman Empire, right, um, and, and how that affected the Jewish people in Israel. So that's all the political stuff. Now I need to backtrack and talk a little bit about the cultural stuff. It's hard to say how the Persians culturally affected Israel, but we can definitely say how the Greeks did, uh, the Hellenistic effect, just because there's more sources, more was written. Okay, so let's talk about the impact of Hellenism, of Greek culture. Okay, Greek philosophy, language, culture, and religion uh, it influenced all the conquered regions after Alexander the Great. So all over the world, people are going to know about Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. Okay? And of course, Socrates said it's all about education. Plato was an idealist, and I'll explain what some of that means in a little bit. Aristotle was more of a, a realist that believed in the first cause. You then end up with uh, Zeno, who uh, created Stoicism. You end up with Epicurus, who created Epicureanism. Okay, these are all big philosophers, and by the way, they're all mentioned in the Bible. Okay, how many of you have read Acts chapter 17, verse 18, and it says Paul was arguing with the Stoics and the Epicureans in the marketplace? Now, you might be saying, what the heck's a Stoic and an Epicurean? Well, the New Testament expects you to know what it is because they don't tell you what they believed. You're supposed to be like, ah, oh, Stoic and an Epicurean. And so if you can't do that, that's why we got a class like this, so you can understand who these people are. So let me uh, first talk about um, Plato, okay? Not the stuff you used to play with as a kid that's non-toxic, P-L-A-T-O, um, Plato. He was an idealist, and just to put it in the simplest way that I can, he believed that, like, you look around this world, you got people, you got trees, you got stuff, and it's all beautiful, but it's imperfect, and it changes, right? When he looks at, at, at reality, what he sees is things change, they break down, so this can't be ultimate reality. Ultimate reality has to be eternal. So what he said is there's a singular divine mind, and in the mind of that singular divine being, there's the idea of a perfect man and woman, 
perfect tree, perfect dog, perfect table, perfect whatever, okay? So the perfect eternal version exists in the mind of this one divine being. And then what he did is, is, is he's good and he loves his thinking. So he emanates out from himself and it becomes matter. And then you end up with material versions, copies of the perfect idea in his mind. That's why it's called idealism. And so pretty much there's only one man in the mind of the one being, but you got all sorts of men on earth. Some of us bald, some of us short, some of us big noses, some of us warts, whatever it might be. That's all because we live in a material universe that changes and falls apart. But we're all derived from the idea of the one perfect man. And so um, one way that you could think of it is, you know, if you ever made cookies before, like little man-shaped cookies, the dough is the matter, but you got your little stencil and you just keep pressing it in, you know. And then when you cook them, even though they're all the same shape, they don't always technically look the same. There's always a little difference from one to the next. And so that baking analogy kind of explains how, how Plato saw the world. And so in that kind of mindset, matter's kind of bad. It represents corruption and spirit represents eternity and universal and, and what's good. And so with the Platonic mindset, um, matter's evil, spirit's good, and this is going to lead to all sorts of things the early church is going to have to deal with, mainly something called Gnosticism. And I'll talk about that when we get to the early church um, because they're going to take Plato and, and, and his ideas and really just put them on ideological steroids and uh, come up with some pretty crazy sounding stuff from it. Okay, so that's Plato and idealism. Aristotle, who was Plato's student, said, you know what, I don't think he knows what he's talking about. How in the world could he know that there's this one being that has all these thoughts in his mind and those thoughts became what we see here? Aristotle said, no, what we see is what's real. But since what's real moves, it's motion, Okay, what we notice is when something moves, something made it move, and then it makes something else move. So you have to go back, and it can't go back forever. There has to be a first mover. That first mover is the one God. Okay, and that's all Aristotle would really say. Now, what's interesting is in the Middle Ages, church uh, leaders, scholastics, would argue who was the better Christian, Plato or Aristotle. Neither of them were Christians. That's why it's so dumb of an argument. But you could see why maybe they were sympathetic to them. Aristotle did not believe in many gods. He said there can only be one that started everything. Christians believe that. So they'd be like, Aristotle's right. But then Plato would say, but whatever God is, he's not like the universe because the universe changes. God doesn't change. And so they'd be like, well, Plato's kind of right. Now, again, these were pagans. They didn't believe exactly what the Bible says. But for some reason, church leaders, especially in the you know, 1200s, really loved these guys. Um, both of them provide a classical foundation to philosophy. And then when you, you may have heard of Stoicism. We use the word saying, oh, that person's so stoic, like they have no emotions. There's truth to that. Stoicism was the idea that you have this, uh, this universal principle that organizes everything called the logos or the word. Okay? And, and they see it as being an aspect of the one divine source. Um, and then pretty much the, what they believed in was extreme fate, that everything's going to happen is meant to happen. So if you want to be a happy person, just embrace fate, embrace your destiny. It's kind of like if, if you jump in a boat and you're sailing upstream, you're going to wear yourself out and probably crash into some rocks. But if you turn around and just go where the water takes you, then you're not going to be stressed out, stressed out. What if it takes you right over Niagara Falls to a bloody death? Well, that was fate. You know, stressing about it isn't going to make you not splatter on the way down. You know, so that's why they would say that, you know, it doesn't matter. What's going to happen is going to happen. Just embrace whatever happens, okay? And so there was a reason why the Roman army liked Stoics. They were really good um, arrow fodder, if you will. Hey, they're, they're, all, they're fine with dying. Send them to the front line, you know? And so, um, so yeah, Stoicism. Now, they did reject all, like, the, the gods and all that. So if you notice these philosophers, the interesting thing is with human reason alone, they were able to correctly reason back where to, to the fact that there can only be one God. It was mainly the popular level street people, in a sense, who believe, no, there's, you know, Zeus and Hera and all that. But the people who are the deep thinkers, they're like, that just doesn't work. Now, Epicurus is going to take it in a completely different direction, and he was a skeptic. It wouldn't be right to call him an atheist, but 
I mean, he was almost there. He said he didn't believe any, that any of the gods existed. But if they did, he said it doesn't matter anyway. And so there's no purpose. There's no afterlife. All you are is matter. So the highest principle in life isn't, uh, you know, spirit. It isn't matter. It's just pleasure. And so the Epicureans, now today, the word Epicureanism refers to like foodies. You know, the, it has to deal with like food and cooking and all that. Back then, um, you know, it was more about just like having your pleasures in moderation. So it wasn't about too much fornication. It wasn't about too much alcohol. It wasn't about too much food because they would say if you have too much, that actually decreases your pleasure. So the Epicurean would say, find that perfect balance where you have just the right amount of everything, and that's what life's all about. And so that became a popular philosophy as well. Uh, and Paul, again, debates both of them in Acts chapter 17, verses, uh, verse 18. So these guys, uh, they were there. They were all around. Now, when we get to the popular religion of the time, and um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll get to the end of, of the Greeks, and then I'll, I'll close this. And then next time we'll pick up with Roman contributions and, and then eventually we got to talk about Israel itself and what the Jews believed at that time. But let me finish with the Greeks. When it came to popular religion, you know, the Greeks were polytheistic. They believed in a lot of gods and their religion was pessimistic. They weren't the most positive people because their gods were like Avengers, but worse. Okay, they were superhumans that were selfish. They got drunk. They fornicated. They did bad things. They were pedophiles. And, and you just couldn't trust them. You didn't know if the gods were going to turn on you or if they were going to help you. They were nothing like Yahweh. And they definitely were not like omnipresent, omniscient, omnibenevolent. They were spatially located just like you and me. The difference was they were immortal and had superpowers and some of them could throw lightning. I mean, that's what they were believing. Okay, but these guys did, I mean, these gods, they did some, uh, some bad stuff. Right. And so just a little bit about the pantheon. Zeus would be the chief god, according to the Greeks. Hera was his wife. She was the goddess of women and marriage. Hermes was the messenger of the gods. And he was the god of thieves and merchants. I find that kind of funny. Like the thieves have their own god. May I have a successful pickpocketing today, Hermes? I mean, that's just it's like for real. And then at the same time, he takes care of the merchants as well. What were they saying? That businessmen were thieves, too? I mean, come on. Um, and then uh, Poseidon was the, the god of the sea, Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty, and, you know. And then Ares, the god of war, Hades, the god of the underworld, and Artemis, the goddess of forest, hills, and fertility. Now, what, what, what's interesting here is Hermes. I, I really like this one uh, because in Acts chapter 14, verse 12, Paul heals a guy who was lame from birth and starts preaching, and the locals think that he's Hermes, and they think that Barnabas is Zeus. And so they're going to try to worship these two. And then, of course, they tear their clothes and, and rebuke these guys. But, but the interesting thing is, why did they think Paul was Hermes? And why did they think Barnabas was Zeus? Well, because if Hermes is the messenger of the gods, he's the only one that talks. Zeus is too dignified to talk. So it's the lower god, Hermes, that talks. So the funny thing is, Paul's doing all the work. Barnabas is just sitting there quiet. And these people are thinking, that guy who ain't saying anything, he's the real G here. You know, that's Zeus. This guy's just Hermes. And so I just kind of find it insulting to Paul. But anyhow, um, so that's kind of a funny thing. And then in Acts chapter 19, verses 28 and 29, Paul's uh, work in Ephesus is so successful that people stop buying idols to Artemis. And so there's a riot that happens in that city where they want to find Paul and kill him. And for hours, they, start, they, they, they shout in the amphitheater, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So again, if you're reading your New Testament, and you see these guys call Paul Hermes, and you see them shouting, great is Artemis against Paul in another chapter, it does you well to know what they're talking about. And again, that's what this lesson's all about. When you get to Malachi, there is no Hermes, there is no Zeus, and there's no Artemis. But that stuff is on the pages of the New Testament. Now, um, one more thing on Greek contributions, and then I'll show you a couple books, and then um, we'll, uh, we'll call it. But... Um, but Greek contributions. So you want to know how this impacted everything? Just open your Bible in the original language, the New Testament. It's written in Greek. Specifically, it's written in Koine Greek. It became the lingua franca. Uh, and it was the means by which the New Testament uh, spread the word of God. Um, now, before, like if you go back five, six hundred years, scholars didn't know it was Koine Greek, but they knew it was different from classical Greek. So they thought it was like a spirit-filled Greek. But later they learned, no, this was just street Greek. 
Um, so if you want to understand what Koine Greek is, put it this way. Okay, so in Greece and Athens, they spoke sophisticated, flowery Greek. But when you conquer half the world and all these peoples are learning Greek as a second language, are they going to be as smooth with it as the people in Athens? Are they going to be as sophisticated with it as the people in Athens? No. Koine Greek is the Greek of the world. It's the Greek of those who it's their second language. It's kind of like English, right, is a, Engl is a lingua franca all over the world now. If you go to certain parts of the world, yeah, a lot of them speak English, but is it at the level as it is in London or, you know, and as it would be at Harvard or, or whatever? No. And so Koine Greek, it's, it's, it's Greek, but it was a Greek that was spoken by just about everybody in the eastern half of the Roman Empire, including the Jews. And so um, I will go take some candy from the youth group and give it to anybody here who could actually read and translate that Greek verse there and tell me what verse it is in the Bible. It's John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You got that. So can you read it? I'll still steal some candy for you because I was still good. I, no, I recognize in uh, ha lagos kai. I love it. So you knew enough to be dangerous, you know, which, <laughs> which is good. But so, yeah, it says, in arche hain ha lagos kai. Halagas hain pros ton theon kai theos hain ha lagos. So literally translated, and it's important to know this because Jehovah Witnesses try to twist it. If you were going to translate this in the most wooden literal way, it says, "In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God was the Word." Right. So a lot of our translations will say, "And the Word was God," and Jehovah Witnesses will be like, "Well, well, the, it doesn't say the Word; it just says." word or a word was God. But in the Greek, it's literally, and God was the word. Okay. And there's a particular grammatical um, uh, rule here. But if you notice in, in Greek, word order doesn't always matter, but sometimes it does. And in this case, it does. And so theos, God, hey, which is was, halagos, God was the word. And so, you know, it, it, it's very clear what this is saying. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you put the, the beautiful statement of who Jesus is, you know, and it was displayed in Greek. It was displayed in Greek. Now, some people will be like, well, hold on. You, you said the Stoics believed that there was this universal principle um, pretty much moving history called the Logos. So did John the Apostle just steal this idea from the Stoics and, and uh, you know, put it in, in Jewish religion? No, this is a translation of an Aramaic idea called Memra. Um, and so we got all these targums where it talked about you have God and then his word and his word speaks, his word creates, his word. Pretty much logos here is just the Greek translation of memra. It's not stealing it from the Stoics. It's elaborating upon a concept that was already well known and accepted among the Jews at the time that within God, OK, there may be multiple aspects uh, of unity within this one divine being. Now, they wouldn't articulate it as the Trinity yet. The church would. Um, but even before the church, even before the New Testament, you have moves like this being made. So it's just kind of, uh, kind of interesting. Wanted to, to share that with you, um, <clears throat> and I will get you your, your candy for that. So, so one, one thing that I want to, you know how like last time I explained books and where you could learn stuff? Um, I remember how I mentioned that, you know, the first thing you want to start off with is good secondary sources or lectures like this. Um, and then eventually you want to move into the primary sources. So let me... Uh, got the dialogues of Plato. If you want to know more about Plato and what he thought, because this is going to be a very dominant philosophy for many, many millennia to come. Here's Plato. Here's Aristotle. If you want to know the, the literature of the time, you know, the most famous uh, Greek epic was the Iliad, uh, which is interesting. Um, this is uh, pretty much the, um, the meditations by Emperor Marcus Aurelius, who was uh, one of the world's most famous Stoics. And I don't want to get ahead of myself. The Golden Ass is a Roman book. I'll talk about that next week. Um, it's talking about a donkey, so no, I did not cuss. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, you know, but if you want a good uh, uh, secondary source on the history of the time that we're talking about here, this by Michael Grant, it's from Alexander to Cleopatra. So it starts with Alexander's conquest and ends with Caesar Augustus becoming the Roman emperor and then you end up with uh, the Roman hegemony. So this would be a, a good walkthrough on some of this stuff to at least understand. Other books that I have up here, 
to help you with the Roman side and then other books to help you with the Oriental or Jewish side. And I'll bring those back and share those next week. But pretty much I'm going to call it now because it's been an hour. Um, Rachel, could you hit the, the stop on that? And then I'll take any questions if anybody has them once she hits stop. You remember how?